Hello everybody and welcome to my May 2021 reading wrap up. The older I get, the worse I get with time, man. Dane reads. It is May, isn't it? It is 2020, yeah it is 2021, okay. All right, let's get started. So uh, I have a few more of these Spike Milligans to to uh, talk about because I'd sort of read a few of these at the end of last week's reading wrap up. So we're going to start with Robin Hood, according to Spike Milligan. Now I only know the vague outline of the Robin Hood tale. I've never really been into Robin Hood, so I've never read like any of the original books on it or anything like that. Uh, so my my main knowledge of Robin Hood comes from Disney, you know, actually cracking tune though. Uh, cracking. I was thinking of a uh, great song. Anyway, Robin Hood, according to Spike Milligan, like 3.5 out of 5, it was okay. Probably more interesting to me than the original Robin Hood. Because these are basically like humorous satire slash, slash parody of, of like the original stories that are, that are mentioned in it, you know. Uh, so that then moves us on to Treasure Island, according to Spike Milligan. That one I gave a 4 out of 5 to. Um, Treasure Island's one of those weird ones where I never particularly got on with it. Um, especially like the final half of it, I think is really slow. To me, the most fun part of Treasure Island is the bit right at the beginning, set at the inn, you know? And then they go off to the Treasure Island of the title and it gets a bit dull, but... Uh, it was fun reading it with Milligan's take on it. The only thing I would say is he kept using the same joke. So he kept having people go, I can't swim. And somebody else would go, well, I can't play violin, but you don't hear me shouting about it. Yeah, I think that happened once in Robin Hood and then four times in Treasure Island. So, you know, I'm kind of like, please stop recycling your jokes. It's starting to do my fruit in. But um, yeah, it was all right. If you're a fan of the original classics and you like Spike Milligan or you just like parodies, you might like it. I, I don't think I'd recommend this to most people to be honest although I will say maybe it's because he's taking on the classics or maybe it's because it was written towards the end of his life actually like in the late 90s there are references to the Spice Girls and stuff but it was surprisingly non-racist for Spike Milligan there were no n-bombs which is unusual for him and then, we, and then I read In the Miso Soup by Ryu Murakami. So this was recommended to me by Robert Honor, who is a friend of mine. I know him through the Open Mics, a late Facebook group where people can go and, you know, share their, you know, home recorded videos and stuff in the absence of open mics during lockdowns, etc. Uh, but I also chatted to him for my radio show and he said this was the last book that he read and he really recommended it. So I picked it up and it's pretty good. I would probably give this one a, a pretty, pretty strong 4 out of 5, not quite a 4.5. Uh, it does say here, there's a quote from The Guardian, reads like the script notes for American Psycho, The Holiday Abroad. And it certainly does, although I found it more interesting than American Psycho. <laughs> so if you like American Psycho, you'll like this. There's a lot of violence in it. Basically, it's about like a Japanese, a Japanese dude who's about 20 who works showing people around the sex industry in Tokyo. And he gets this, this American customer client called Frank. And he starts to think that maybe Frank's like nuts and killing people. Uh, and it kind of goes on from there and we get some pretty like brutal scenes like people getting stabbed in the eye and stuff Oh, and at one point Frank is like um, Yes, you, you, you can't beat having sex with a woman who's currently dying because she can't fight back But the vagina's still warm and you're just like oh, that's a bit That's a bit, you know, and then he puts he cuts the woman's ear off and puts it in the vagina But first he has to take her tampon out it's one of those kind of books, you know? So probably trigger warnings for everything. I mean, to be fair, if you've not been triggered by what I've just said, you'll probably be all right with the rest of the book because that was probably one of the worst scenes in it. Um, but I, I think I just have like an iron stomach because he was like, don't read this before bed. And I'm reading it just being like, oh, cool. It's getting a bit brutal, you know? I could quite like that. I, ha I have, <laughs> it doesn't freak me out, you know? If it was a movie, I think I would probably have nightmares. But as it's a book, I'm just like, yeah, this is pretty good. So, yeah, in the miso soup, four out of five. Hello, everybody. Lots of books to talk about. And these won't necessarily be in the right order, but I, don't, I can't remember what order I read them in now. So we have Senior Nice by Howard Marks. I gave this one like a 3.5 out of five. Howard Marks is a former drug smuggler. His uh, other book, or his most well-known book, is Mr. Nice, which is like his memoirs of his time as a smuggler. This covers after he got out of jail, and he basically sort of spent some time traveling, writing for newspapers and stuff, doing book tours. Uh, and he kind of goes out of his way to um, recapture his Welsh heritage by tracking down, like, you know, relatives of former family members and all of this stuff, but, like, historical relatives. He finds out uh, Henry Morgan, the pirate, uh, he was Welsh. 
Uh, there may be some Welsh connection to Elvis and a few other famous people. All in all, it was pretty good. I mean, it was hard. I think it was hard for him because Mr. Nice is writing about drug smuggling. He was like one of the biggest drug smugglers in the world, uh, smuggling like 30 tons of cannabis or whatever it was. Uh, it doesn't actually say exactly how much on the back of this. But yeah, that's obviously easy, easier to write about and make it exciting than just travel writing, I suppose. But yeah, still enjoyed. Uh, then I read A Christmas Carol 2, Contagion by Charles Dickens and Bruno Vincent. Bruno Vincent is known for writing the famous five books for adults, so like Five Go on a Strategy Away Day and stuff. He is pretty good at imitating other authors' styles, but um, I was expecting more from this, to be honest, and actually it's got pretty low ratings on Goodreads. I mean, I think I gave it a three out of five and it dragged the average rating up, so that tells you a lot. Um, yeah, probably don't really bother with this unless you're a big Dickens fan. I also read Why I'm Afraid of Bees by R.L. Stein. This is one of the original Goosebumps series books and I've just been, um, I guess, recapturing me, my childhood by reading some of these. A uh, full review of this coming soon, but it held up pretty well, I think. 3.5 out of 5. Let me just let the cat out. Come on then, I've got to close the door. Otherwise we get shadow, don't we? I also read William Shakespeare's The Force Doth Awaken by Ian Dersher, so very similar in theme to the Bruno Vincent one. Uh, I've read a lot of these because he's done the entire nine um, Star Wars movies. Um, this is the weakest one so far that I've read, but I think part of that is because I'm not a particular fan of the movie. Um, so I gave it three out of five. It was actually kind of funny though because the, uh, the six that I've read, no, I, I think I've read four so far because I accidentally got this thinking it was the second of the prequels, but it's not, obviously. So, so I've read the original trilogy and then I read The Phantom of Menace. Um, and yeah, I think this was kind of interesting in a way because it read more like Shakespeare purely because when I read Shakespeare, quite often I don't really know who's who and what's going on and stuff. And I had that going on here because I'm not, I've only seen um, The Force Awakens once, twice now, because I watched it again after reading this. But yeah, like three out of five. I also read Le Tour de Gaulle d'Asterix, par, Arge, par Argesini et Aedertsu, set on uh, Bon Dessinaire en Francais. C'est uh, très bon, uh, numéro 100 dans, dans la série. Oui, très bien. And then I read Espadare Street by Ian M. Banks. So this was recommended to me first by a poet friend called Nigel Cresswell, and then by a writer friend called um, K.R. Boiter, who's also a medium. And while, we, while, he, while I was interviewing him for my radio show, he was like, oh yeah, the spirits have mentioned Ian Banks. Do you read much of him? And I was like, well, I've only read one of his sci-fi books. And he honed, on in, honed in on this particular book. And uh, it was just weird because somebody else had been talking to me about it, you know, a few days earlier. And he would have had no way of knowing that, you know? So I took it as a sign, read it. It was all right. Pretty strong 3.5 out of five. It was kind of like watered down Irving Welsh. Um, and it follows uh, like the trials and tribulations of a songwriter who's like looking back at his time in a fairly well-known band. So it has some tie-ins with a, a novel that I've written called Monsters of Rock as well. But um, yeah, it was, it was all right. Hello everybody, just the one book to wrap up for you today and that is The Fog by James Herbert. This is a horror novel, it's Herbert's second novel. Um, and I love the way he writes, so he writes in this way, it's very just sort of conversational, it makes it feel as though you're just chatting to some guy in a pub and he's telling you what happened. Uh, but then also he's very brutal at times as well, so there are some pretty like disturbing scenes in this, like a man gets his head chopped off and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting, there was a great scene where the entire population of a seaside town here in the UK just walked into the sea to commit mass suicide. Uh, I gave this a 4 out of 5 and a full review will be coming soon. This is my second James Herbert book and it's the second he wrote. I've read The Rats and now this, which are his first two books in order. So, uh, and I have like two or three more James Herbert to read, so I'll be reading those soon. Hello everybody, just the one book to wrap up for you today and that is The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher or The Murder at Roadhill House by Kate Summerscale. This is true crime about a crime that happened in Victorian England. Uh, a three year old, I think, child called Saville was found with his throat cut. Um, and it follows Mr. Witcher who is one of the original team of like homicide detectives, I guess. Uh, as he tries to investigate the crime. Really sort of gripping read. I, I was expecting this to be a lot more intense than it was. Uh, it doesn't focus 
so heavily on the crime. It kind of drifts off into the social mores of Victorian England and what like the societal response to it was. But I found that interesting enough. I was thinking it was probably going to have to be a bedtime book, but actually I just read it as my main book and enjoyed it. It's kind of like In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, but a little bit more, uh, more easily digestible, I think. There's also a TV series of this, which I haven't seen, but I do plan to watch. And I'm particularly excited because it turns out Paddy Considine is in it, who's one of my favourite actors. I always say I'd want him to play me in a film of my life. Yes, I know Biggie. So uh, yeah, I gave this a four out of five and would recommend true crime buffs or anybody who's into stuff about Victorian England. Otherwise, you're probably not gonna enjoy it that much, but hey ho, I did. Hello everybody, just a few books to wrap up for you today. Uh, we'll start off with this little bit Spike Milligan. So I read The Little Pot Boiler, A Dustbin of Milligan, uh, the Bedside Milligan and a book of bits or a bit of a book. So each of these are quite short and I read each of them during a bath So each one lasted one bath. They're kind of collections of his sort of humorous poetry a uh, few bits of his sort of surrealistic um, prose fiction, which It's kind of almost like Ed, um, it's, it's kind of almost Lear like almost C.S. Lewis like um, And Milligan was a big influence to John Lennon. So that's one of the reasons why I've been working my way through all of his stuff um, I've got to say, Milligan is one of those people where the more of his books I read, the less I kind of like his books. There is a problem with kind of casual racism throughout them all as well, but even discounting that, you know? Um, so I gave a dustbin of Milligan 2 out of 5, I thought that was really sucky to be honest. The Little Pot Boiler was 3.5 out of 5, and these other two were all uh, 3 out of 5, just okay. Then I read Bizarro Bad Dreams by Stephen King, so this is a short story collection, one of his newer ones. Bunch of stories in here about all kinds of different stuff. We have a, like an obituary writer who starts accidentally predicting, uh, basically when he writes down people's names they die. We have something similar actually in another story with this old judge where he can see the names of people who are about to die written in the sand in this like little island near where he lives. Um, there was a like a haunted car, I guess, a la Christine. What was particularly cool about this was that each of his uh, stories in here are prefaced by a little introduction where he writes about where he got the ideas for the stories, which reminded me of Isaac Asimov. He does that in all of his short story collections, and it's one of the things I really enjoy about his work. So I enjoyed seeing King do the same thing. There are also a couple of poems in here that weren't particularly good, but overall, the quality of the stories was, was not King at his best, but it was still up there, and obviously King at his worst is still better than most of their best. So I gave this collection a 4 out of 5. Hello everybody, right let's start with a few here that um, basically I have to refilm these because I don't know where the footage has gone. I think I actually read these in April but I'm already so far behind with posting my April wrap up that I was just like screw it we'll put them into May. So I read Uncommon Type by Tom Hanks, this is a collection of short stories, Tom Hanks the actor. Surprisingly good actually, I said in um, my review of it that I think um, it wouldn't have got published if he hadn't been Tom Hanks, mainly because it's a short story collection. But it had been pretty well written, well uh, edited as well, uh, like a professional quality release, which is always nice. And the stories all had this gimmick where like, they all relate back to typewriters in some way, which I thought was good. I gave it a 4 out of 5. I would have given it a 3.5 out of 5 uh, had it not been Tom Hanks. But weirdly, I'm like weirdly impressed that a celebrity who's not known as a writer was able to write something so good. I think if it had been uh, released as an indie collection, I would have been very impressed. Then we have A Marathon Man by William Goldman. This was a bit of a forgettable one, to be honest. Uh, Goldman also wrote Butch Cassidy and The Sundance Kid, as well as The Princess Bride. And uh, Marathon Man is basically like a thriller, except it wasn't particularly thrilling, so I was just kind of glad when it finished, to be honest. Uh, I watched the movie afterwards, and I thought the movie was a little bit better than the book, which was also my impression of The Princess Bride. Overall, wouldn't really recommend. It was a weak 3.5 out of 5. Then I read I Am A Thing Of Rough Edges by Tom Rudd. This was a poetry collection, indie poetry. Again, it was okay. Um, unfortunately, I don't still have it tabbed out, otherwise I would have read one or two of the poems that stood out to me. Um, but yeah, it had good like transgender representation in it, uh, which was, you know, interesting enough. Uh, the poetry was so-so. Again, a pretty weak 3.5 out of 5. And then we have this Hound of the Baskervilles by Spike Milligan, or the Hound of the Baskervilles according to Spike Milligan by Spike Milligan. And this is basically one of Milligan's like humorous retellings of the Hound of the Baskervilles, the Sherlock Holmes book. Uh, it was amusing, I quite liked it as well because I could clearly follow along with where he'd use like original plot points and where he'd turn them into jokes and stuff. So probably, I think that's my favourite of the Spike Milligan retellings, I gave it a 4 out of 5. Then I read uh, The Spear by James Herbert, so 
I've not had much luck with James Herbert recently. The first two of his that I read were The Rats and The Fog, which were both excellent. And then I read, I can't even remember the name, oh, oh The Survivor I read recently, that was okay. And then The Spear, uh, this one is a bit of a thriller. Um, it's got some like historical vibes to it because a lot of it ties back to Germany during the Second World War. There's a lot of stuff about Jews and like Israeli versus Palestinian politics, which was quite interesting reading this now. You know, while uh, Gaza's under attack and, you know, all this stuff. Hashtag Free Palestine. Uh, that, that's the woke thing to say. I actually don't really know enough about the situation to, to have a comment. I just think everybody should stop killing each other. I do think uh, the Israelis should probably give Palestine back to the Palestinians, but hey, what do I know? I'm not fucking intelligent enough or woke enough. I don't know, I'm British. We don't, we're barely struggling to understand Brexit, mate. Um, but yeah, it was okay. Again, uh, there were some references to the Thule Society, which is cool because I've kind of come across that before. Um, there were bits of like really good action in this, like uh, the main characters getting chased in a... Um, he's in a car, in a mini, and they're being chased by a tank, which was quite cool. But there were also a lot of bits where I was just like, eh, I'm not really too invested in this story. Overall, week 3.5 out of 5. Alright, just two books to update you on today. The first is Five Get Gran Online by Enid Blyton, although it's actually by Bruno Vincent. Bruno Vincent does these kind of humorous takes on uh, like old classic authors, so I recently read he did A Christmas Carol 2 Contagion, which wasn't very good. I have read a few of these uh, famous five takes before though, and this one was good, as were the others. In it, basically, the famous five are grown up and have to deal with like very 21st century problems, so in Five Get Gran Online, they're helping their gran to wrap her head around the internet and setting up her internet banking and all of this stuff. Lots of fun, gave it a four out of five, full review coming soon. And then I read Pacoon by Spike Milligan, so um, there's not really a blurb on the cover of this and there isn't really a plot as such, it's just a lot of strange stuff happening in this place called Pacoon, uh, which is like on the Irish border, like there was a guy who died and they wanted to bury him and they wouldn't let them, him bury him because it was going to be on what was now British controlled parts of Ireland and he didn't have a passport so he had to go and get his passport photo taken even though he was dead. So a lot of this sort of surrealist stuff that Milligan's known for, a little tiny bit of casual racism unfortunately, but it just happens with Milligan unfortunately. But if you can kind of look past it and remind yourself also that he's dead, so hey ho. Um, and you know, you don't have to agree with his racism. In fact, I would argue that you shouldn't agree with his racism. Yeah, overall 3.5 out of 5, it was fun stuff. Alright guys, just the one book to update you on, and that is Vox by Christina Dolce. This book was okay, it does say on the front a petrifying reimagining of The Handmaid's Tale and for me it was a little bit too derivative of The Handmaid's Tale for me. I mean don't get me wrong, I love a ha The Handmaid's Tale, but this just felt as though she'd read The Handmaid's Tale and was like, oh I wish I'd written that and so she wrote this, you know. It has a really cool uh, concept which is that women are forced to wear these wrist bracelets that monitor how many uh, words they speak and when they get to 100 it gives them an electric shock and they're not allowed to talk anymore. And so that concept was really cool and there were some nice little bits of philosophy and stuff but I just wanted to see more of the differences that these bracelets made to society, you know? And we didn't really get too much of that, unfortunately. It was mostly more of like a take down the government plot kind of thing. I mean, the main character has her device removed pretty quickly as well. Um, and I just, I didn't get what I was hoping for from this, I suppose. But it was still okay. I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. Definitely worth reading if you're into like dystopian feminist literature. Um, I just thought that it didn't quite execute on the concept. There's also like the writing, the writing isn't as good as the idea is. So it was like a very like workman-like or workwoman-like book. Um, where, you know, I guess the thing with The Hammy's Tale is that it's, it's Margaret Atwood writing it as well. So she's a really good writer. Um, so you've got the concept and the writing there really kind of both stand out. Whereas this, great concept, but the execution and the actual writing, not so much. But I am still glad I read it. And there are dickheads going past up and down the street outside my house. Hello everybody, just a few books to wrap up to round this one off for you. Although there might be more because I keep filming wrap ups and then losing bits of the footage. So I need to investigate if I'm missing any. But anyway, here we have uh, One Pound Meals by Miguel Barclay. This is a vegan recipe book. Uh, I will say this is probably more suited if you're new to veganism, if you're like relatively established or whatever, if you've been doing it for a while and you've read other vegan cookery books. There's not much like innovative here. Uh, it does go on the, like the cheaper side of things and shows that plant-based eating doesn't need to be super expensive, but there are like flaws. So for example, it'll say to use a quarter of a thing of tofu and it's like, well, that makes it more than a one pound meal. Granted, maybe not if you're just using tofu and lentils or something, but one block of tofu is like three pounds. So 
even though you're only using a quarter of it, you still have to buy the whole thing, you know? So yeah, I don't know about the one pound meals, it's more like maybe three pound meals. You could get away with one pound servings maybe if you scaled up the recipes. Um, and a lot of the stuff in it, again, is like hummus and it's like I already have recipes for that. So the only one that I actually kept from this for my overall master list of recipes was um, his uh, uh, Sloppy Joe's recipe, although it was very tasty. But um, yeah, some good stuff in here still. It's a pretty weak 3.5 out of 5. Then we've got some Vonnegut. So I read The Wayward Bus. Now my edition of this is falling apart, as you can see. Um, but I did still enjoy it. It's one where it's very much about the journey rather than the destination. It takes part on this titular bus. Uh, I think it's going, is it across California? Across country, it says. Um, and yeah, it basically like follows the lives of the various people that board this bus and stuff. Um, John Steinbeck's very good at doing this like slice of life kind of stuff, so it was quite cool. Uh, in that respect and uh, interesting characters storyline was kind of taking a back seat a lot of actually the interesting bits of the narrative was stuff that had already happened and like characters were looking back on it and stuff but still interesting enough glad i read it 3.5 out of 5 for this one then i've got uh, palm sunday by kurt vonnegut so this was a bedtime book um basically it's a load of non-fiction like essay speeches various other bits that vonnegut uh, wrote and kind of all pulled together here now to me it reminded me of what you get after an author dies and their editor goes through all of their like unreleased and various bits and bobs and just pulls together a book almost for the sake of it and for like completionists who want to read it all but Vonnegut was still alive and like involved with the publication of this so I don't know it wasn't like the best I probably I'll give it a strong three out of five uh, easily the weakest Vonnegut that I've read so far but there were some interesting bits in it a lot of it as well though it's just like him talking about his family history and it's like mate I don't care about your family history I want to know more about you um, and I guess to an extent his family history does come into play but yeah it just wasn't wasn't the greatest read uh, then we have another three out of five so this is to a god unknown by john steinbeck again this is one of his like slice of life things the main gist of this story is that like a bunch of farmers are waiting for the rains and they're hoping that the rains will come in and sort of help them all out because it's dry season and all of this stuff but i don't really relate to that i mean i i'm against farming anyway apart from you know i suppose uh, crop farming but that wasn't necessarily what it was about um, so lots of like animals dying and stuff which makes me sad um, but also I just didn't really connect with the characters or the plot of this one so it was just a slow old read there were still some bits of beauty and some great bits of dialogue but overall just a 3 out of 5 from me and finally we have Double Kiss by Ronnie O'Sullivan so this is one of his Soho Nights series of crime novels this is Ronnie O'Sullivan the snooker player although I'm pretty sure he worked with a ghostwriter on this one but it was okay, there were some mistakes in it, like this is published by Pam McMillan and there were some like little typos and mistakes and stuff that you would have expected a decent editor to have, editor to have picked up on, but uh, hey ho, I mean it's still alright, it's the second book of three, I don't know if any more are coming out, I guess not because I think when I looked them up it was like they'd been released on like the 17th of November, 16th of November, 15th of November, three years in a row, and that takes us up to like two, three years ago and he hasn't done any more since. But they were still uh, alright, the first book was a lot better though, because the first book really throws you in right at the beginning, and this main character's like, we start the story with him being accused of murder, you know? Whereas with this one it took about 150 pages to get into the plot. Right. And I think it just over relied on people being interested in the characters, uh, which I wasn't necessarily, was I Biggie? No. Mm, 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 mm. Oh you smell lovely, yes. You've been cleaning yourself. You won't go down. You won't go down. Come on then. There you go. There you go. Treat, treat. I have gone red again, and I don't know why. But anyway, uh, I have some books to wrap up for you. These are ones. This should be for my May wrap up, and it's currently like the 10th of July. So this is how behind I am with filming and editing. But basically, I finished editing my May wrap up and realised I was missing some books as usual. So we have Tomorrow's Children by Isaac Asimov can't really remember it too well. I think it was a short story collection. That's about all I got for you, so I guess that was a 3.5 out of 5. We have Small Dreams of a Scorpion by Spike Milligan. So this was poetry, a lot of it animal themed. Um, bearing in mind Spike Milligan, he can quite often be quite racist in his books. And in this one, 
he wasn't. It wasn't too bad. Uh, in fact, I don't think there was any over casual racism in it, so that's that's something good. Uh, and also, he was like quite an early vegetarian, like quite well known for uh, espousing like animal rights and vegetarianism. So that in, in itself made it quite interesting. But also, the poetry was pretty good. Four out of five for me. And then we have The Roving Mind by Isaac Asimov. So this was a collection of essays that I read as a bedtime book. The only real problem with this one is that like a lot of them had a lot of overlap so he'd have like four or five essays on overpopulation that basically say the same thing it's just one was written for the guardian one was written for the daily mail one was written for buzzfeed or whatever obviously not those particular publishers but you get the gist like he'd just adapt the, what he was saying and the way he was saying it to suit the publication but the overall message and then the information in it was the same also it's like super tiny print and quite dense and long Having said that, I mean, I think I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. Pretty interesting. If you're interested in uh, Asimov, you're probably going to enjoy uh, The Roving Mind, even though, as I say, it's just a collection of essays. So take of that what you will. And then we have The Survivor by James Herbert. So this is um, weirdly similar to Chuck Palahniuk's novel, The Survivor, uh, in that it follows a guy. It's like about a plane crash in a way, um, and it follows a guy that survives a crash. Like, admittedly, I think... I think, yeah, I think he just walks out of the wreckage of it. Uh, and whereas in Survivor, the guy doesn't survive the plane crash, or at least is not even actually in the book. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> and then there's all this like weird supernatural shit going on. Um, I remember like a scene with like a photographer and stuff. It was all right. It was like standard James Herbert. It wasn't as good as uh, The Rats or The Fog or The Mist. No, The Fog. But it was better than some of his others that I read as well. So yeah, 3.5 out of 5 for that. And that's me done, so cutting back to Pastain for the final outro and we can finally get this thing uploaded. So you're probably seeing this in September. And those are all of the books that I read in uh, May. It is now June the 2nd and I'm currently reading, oh I'm not going to tell you because you're going to have to watch my next haul. So uh, no, my next wrap up. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.